Okay, so if we go with the presumption that it's all in. So I, I'll, I'll start us off when Scott does the yeah. intro. Yeah, say, you hey, start it off and, 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 and give us a sense of. Yeah, and I'll say there's a real possibility that something didn't make the show, but we want to tell you what we saw going in. And then when we went in, how it went. And if you missed something on there, that's okay. At least you understand what we were doing. You'll understand. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that'll work. That's what we'll do. I'll we'll we'll right. we'll start up and then I'll say, you know, blah blah blah, blah and then I'll throw it over to you, Greg, and you explain what we're gonna do. And then guys, if you wanna add whatever as we get it in, but I'll I'll, I'll frame it and then we can go from there. Yeah, and explain what each person did, how we started one, went to the other, yep. and the plan was to end yep. up with Chase yep. catching. Yep. I think it's a good opportunity for people to see teamwork and how interrogation works best. Cool. Because I always say, you know, if this works best when we coordinate first. All right, ready? Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created bodylanguagetactics.com with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a best-selling author in persuasion, influence, and people reading. I did 20 years in the U.S. military, and nowadays I'm a trial consultant, and I teach all of those skills to the general public and law firms around the country. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Created this course, BodyLanguageTactics.com, with Scott that has become the number one online learning for body language. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America. Excellent. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about about our experience on uh, the Dr. Phil show. And we're going to talk about the guy that we ended up interrogating on that show, a guy named Tarek. What was his last name? Menturi. Tarek Menturi. Okay. And uh, so we're going to go through, they, they initially sent us a video and shown us the parts they wanted us to break down and say, well, here's what we see in, in this guy's body language, just like we do here on the show. And uh, we took a look at that and we started to talk with Dr. Phil and we said, why don't you let us talk to this guy for a few minutes? I think we may be able to get a little bit more information out of him because that's, it looks to us like he's holding stuff back and we may be able to get some stuff out of him that you may, may not be able to get or that the show may not be able to get and from what we're, we're telling you. So Greg, why don't you, do you explain what we did? Yeah, so what we did was we came up with a plan that involved all four of us. And I get to be the bad guy. I get to be the guy that opens with a really hard gouge. And I'm, I go at this guy pretty hard early. And then Mark steps in. And, of course, Mark sounds like he's going to rescue this kid to him. He's looking and going. Uh, and then Mark, of course, does not rescue him. Mark just compounds and twists a little more. And Scott steps in. And Scott had introduced us to him. So he thought, OK, at least I have a rescuer here. And Scott then went and poked him really, really hard. And then Chase was standing there waiting for him at the end of the at the end of the run. And he was thinking, OK, finally, finally, finally. And Chase was not his friend either. Chase was not aggressive. Chase plugged some things into his head. We're not going to tell you what they are. You watch it on Dr. Phil's probably the best place. But Chase did some really good interrogation close. So you'll see that and understand we had a plan and each of us play a role. And we had well scripted that out. And guys, I've done a lot of interrogations. I've done a lot of tra interrogation training. This is one of the smoothest coordinated orchestrated approaches I've been part of. So thank you for being part of that with us. That was a great one. Thank yeah, you. that was a blast. All right, so let's take a look at the, we've, we've chopped this down to, uh, I think, five or six videos, and we'll look at these one at a time and tell you what we saw in those. And uh, one of the things that showed us why we could get more information out of him from his personality type. I see, you just moved to a different part of town. Got it. Yeah. So would you say then that your business has been, keep trying to look over at the other screen if you don't mind. Um, would you say that your business has been successful? My business has been very successful. Um, you've gotten. All right. Chase, what do you got? This was the most incredible thing. I, I've not been this excited about a behavioral analysis clip for a while. This is an identical replication of what Richard Nixon did when he backed away from the podium and he said, I am not a crook. And then he folded his arms up. It's a perfect thing. So there's two things involved there. We have a the little backward body movement called the postural retreat. And we have that arm folding, which is great behavior. And it's 
indicative of deception, according to me. And he ends his statement with some chin boss movement, this little grief muscle right here, what some people call it, that we express grief with. And there's lip compression at the end. This told me that while we're interrogating him, he is hyper aware of how he appears to other people socially. So he wants the background of the room to have fresh paint. Everything in there is very clean and tidy, he wants his business to look good. So I know with my approach that I need to structure my questions a certain way. Uh, everyone's got different theories about interrogation stuff. My personal thing that I follow is if a person knows they're being interrogated, I'm not doing a good job. And I'm going to need to use that psychological part that I've just learned from this clip to ask him questions a different way. Scott, what do you got? All right. I built my whole uh, theory and approach to this guy on the, on, I feel like he's a psychopath. Most people are under the impression, let me give you a little background on that. Most people are under the impression if you were to give a psychopath a knife and send him into a room, he's going to start stabbing everybody or chopping everybody up. That's not so. That's not so. There, the thing with the psychopath is there's a part of your brain called the amygdala, and that's part of the, uh, the, the part of your brain that turns on um, fight or flight. It deals with empathy and sympathy and those types, and, and those types of feelings, feelings. And usually when, you, when, you're deal, well, when you're dealing with a psychopath, the, the amygdala are either missing, they're damaged, or something's just not right about them. And you can tell that's what's going on in an fMRI machine in a study on and when you study their brain. So there's that. The things that tell that started flipping me little cues that, that we may be dealing with a psychopath was his narcissistic approach to his answers and, and, and the way he acted and his, his behavior. Going to what Chase said as well, for, from all the things from the way he, think, he looked, his concern about the way he was he was accepted socially, everything about him told me that. For example, um, when she when the when she asked him uh, to to stop looking at the screen, to stop looking at himself. Because he's looking at himself, and not only does she, when she tells him to stop, to, to look back at her, look back at the other monitor, he keeps, it takes him a second to come off of that monitor and look at her. That's number one. And then number two, um, we see him grooming. You know, Greg's got a, got a, he's going to talk about that in a few minutes, about this, this eye thing he's doing where he's, he's pushing on his eye. He's trying to make sure he looks good as he's looking at himself. We don't see any concern with him about about what's going on we see no concern whatsoever because and when you're dealing with a psychopath and this is just my feelings this is what i believe i'm not saying that he is they're not worried about uh, about what's going to happen to him because they can't they they have no feelings they have no empathy they can't say here's what's going to happen and here's how it's going to affect me and i'm going to feel this way you won't see that on them most of the time that as you go along they'll learn to mimic uh, people's emotions, they'll mimic your emotions, someone that you know that may be one, they'll, they'll start acting like you do, or they'll act like someone else does. I'll get in, in depth this as we go along, because I think, in my opinion, that's what we're dealing with. I could be completely wrong, but I think that's what we're dealing with. And then I'll talk about the differences in a sociopath and a psychopath as we go along as well. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I, I always say, people say, well, you're not a psychologist, you don't know what a psychopath is. And I say, I'm not a botanist, but I know what poison ivy is. If you touch it enough, you know what something is. So I, Scott, I wouldn't apologize for what you're seeing. But for me, this was immediate. I knew this guy has a problem. You can see him doing what I call request for approval as he's constantly talking. His brow is up and he's trying to get you to say it's OK, kind of like a child who knocks over the cookie jar. And then you look at him and say, did you break the cookie jar? And he goes, no, it was the cat until you say, OK, and then a little brow drops. He's doing that. But interestingly, we have a dominant eye. Anybody who shoots knows dominant eye is where you get your data intake and you use it that way. This guy's dominant eye is shrinking as he gets more and more duress. And I knew it would show up on the show. And I knew I had a brand I could put in his head that he could not escape. So when we talk about, and I agree with you, Chase, when I'm usually interrogating, I don't want you to know you're interrogated. But when I am approaching you and I'm trying to pitch everything and set it up so that when he is getting interrogated at the end, he doesn't realize it. The harder I am, the better it is. So I plugged into his head early. Look, that dominant eye is shrinking. And that's an indicator that you don't like what you're hearing and you're trying to escape it. So we did brow rise, dominant eye, intake issue. And then when, he's, when she said, is your business successful or words to that effect, he said, my business is very 
successful. And he uses that same speech pattern later when he's deceptive again. And then the other final one is watch his head shrink down into his body as his neck disappears. And that's threat response as he knows he's in a bind. And this guy's business was not successful. I and mean, you can go pull his financials and all that, and it's pretty easy to figure out. But his neck was going down in his body as he tried to protect his throat. He may define his business as successful in some other way, but it wasn't successful financially. So that's the beginning. I left him with that brand around his eye. And you'll see if you watch the show, I'm on him pretty hard about that because I know that leaves a mark on it, on his psyche so that he can't relax. Mark, what do you have? Yeah, so here's the way I'm thinking about it. So he's being interviewed here by a uh, an interviewer, researcher, producer um, from you know who works in LA. So a really good people person. It's 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 that person's job to relax this person, to get them open and talking and feeling good and giving a good performance for the for the camera, essentially. So I'm thinking, well, what are his stress levels when you've got somebody who's a really good people person around you? Well, we see an opening sequence here of a, a lip lick, finger touches the eyelid, as, as Gregor says, that's stress. Then he takes a drink from his bottle all of that in quick succession, all of those potentially pacifier gestures, including this big, like almost baby pacifier that he that he has. And think about that. There's there's a lot of um, infantile, juvenile behaviors that we'll see cropping up during this. But we've almost got this kind of baby's bottle, which is both a pacifier and a blocking device, something for him to put between himself and you, the audience, or the interviewer. So that's instantly, uh, you know, pretty important from my point of view. In a situation where, which is totally designed for stress to be reduced and relaxation, his stress is already uh, very, very high. And then he ends with that arm cross there at the end. That's like four, in, uh, quick images in, in quick succession of stress and pressure and wanting to put a barrier between himself and the audience there. So again, what I'm thinking in terms of the interview interrogation that we do later on, I'm thinking, okay, this person is potentially quite easy to heat up. Doesn't take much to heat them up. There. That's where I'll leave that let, one. Let me add one point, because Mark, I think you hit it. When he's pr pressing his eyebrow, He's just, he doesn't understand that brow is not higher. This one is lower. And so he's trying to groom constantly to fix that eyebrow. And we yeah. see that in real time, face to face. And, and yeah. actually, I want, I want people to pay attention to in the show. What happens is he has an excuse for that. Now, to Scott's point there, we've got somebody here who has an excuse for everything. That it's always somebody else's or something else's fault. It's never his fault. It's never his problem. So again, to Scott's point of what is the personality type we have here, uh, we see that an indicator there in the show of it's always somebody else's fault. Yep. Yeah. And we'll get more in depth into that in just a few minutes. Yeah, yeah of course you're killer. And and back to the eye part, there's a, there's a part in there where I think I'm talking, and then Greg jumps up his hind end again with the um, uh, about that. So it's important that you keep in mind as, you, as you've watched, you probably watched that. If you get a chance to watch it again, make sure you, you pay attention to when he does that and what he says when he's doing it, because it really unnerves him. So anyway, just wanted to throw that part in. Yeah, right. guys, I'm not generally a jerk, but there's a time to be a jerk. Well, that's that's the thing. That's the thing about an alpha. You can't always. You, you're not always a jerk, but when you are, you. you I'm it was good the right at time it. to be one. Yeah. yeah, it was a time to be one. So I see. You just moved to a different part of town. Got it. Yeah. That's... So would you say then that your business has been? Keep trying to look over at the other screen if you don't mind. Um, would you say that your business has been successful? My business has been very successful. Um, you've gotten good. All right. Is it good? Yep. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. There is somebody that made allocations that you did, that there were fake reviews or something. Tell me about that. Uh, pretty much all the women are saying that just because they cannot fathom that I actually have people who like me. I guess they just think everyone's going to agree with them. I mean, if you have a bad experience at a restaurant and you write a two-star review, does that mean everyone's going to write a two-star review? No. <laughs> 
Okay. So they're accusing me of fabricating I reviews. I guess they think I have enough time in my hands to create 300 different Gmail addresses and write five-star reviews, despite the fact that when you click the profiles, you'll see they have pictures of other people and activities of dozens of other reviews in other places, which kind of implies they're real profiles. But, you know, some people are just hard-headed and believe what they want to believe. Like these women, hence why they don't believe my allegations either. My, my side of the things, I should say. That's great. I love your passion. I love your energy. So, so thank you. Yeah. She does such a good job of keeping him fired up. Like he's doing the right thing. <clears throat> All right. Well, on this one, I'm going to go first. I usually don't talk a whole lot on these when you deal with psychopaths. That's my favorite thing in the world. So I, I have a little bit more to add to some of these. As we're talking about him, going back to Mark's point a minute ago, before we started this one, it's, it's always somebody else's fault. That's the thing with psychopath. You can, and the, and the, what, what I'll term the clinical narcissist, you can't, you can't even brush up against that ego without really firing them up and getting them on in attack mode. This is what we see here. He goes as far as using his pronouns, the, 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 them and they, he uses the word they six times. He's, he's totally trying to destroy the credibility of, of these women who are accusing him of his accusers by calling them and they, and he calls them them once and they six times. He says the women or those women two times, one to one time each of those. <clears throat> as we go through these, we see 22 different times um, expressions in this in this in this short little little clip. And as we look at this, we're seeing it's a, it's a combination of disgust and disdain. And as he goes through, if you watch, you'll see these this part of his. Some of it comes from just normally talking. When you talk, you'll see those things go up. But his but his disgust and disdain for women, as Mark points out in the show, is over the top, unbelievable. And we see his, his nostrils flare up a little bit, which shows he's getting fired up as well. He's getting a little bit angry, trying to control that anger so he doesn't start going off and becoming the monster that that I would assume this type, this personality type would be. Not saying he's a monster. I'm just saying I would assume in this situation. Um, then, um, and as you see these, a lot of people are going to think this guy is, is autistic. He's not autistic. Don't mistake what you're seeing and what you've heard before about, uh, about autism and, uh, and someone who's autistic or who's on the spectrum, because we're not seeing that. We don't see a whole, a whole lot of eyebrow movement, which is one of the most things you, things you look for when you're dealing with autistics, which is one of the things I learned from Greg. Because when, you, uh, when you're dealing with a psychopath, that, for example, if you're at a bar and someone starts staring at you from across the bar and they don't stop staring at you and you keep looking over and they're still looking at you, for me and you, it would be weird. It would be, it's an odd feeling. It's, it's tough to do that, but it doesn't bother them. That's why you hear people. Uh, they, they, I felt like I was the only person in the room because they don't stop staring at you because they don't understand that it makes you feel weird. And then they should feel weird about it because they don't, because they can't, they don't have the empathetic tools to, to make that happen for them. Um, the whole time he's blaming women. And I think Mark's probably going to go off on that here in a couple of minutes. But that's this whole thing. There's always, you're dealing with an ego when you're dealing with a psychopath. And so he's talking about women the whole time and how it's their their fault and their problem, not him. It's not him. So Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let me also backtrack just a bit. We had the luxury of talking to one of his accusers for an hour and spending real time asking her questions, reading her body language, baselining her, and she was 100% believable. We had zero doubt that what she told us happened. Now, yeah. and this comes into play very nicely as Mark catches him as he's looking for help and Mark catches him to talk about it. But he clearly shows disgust for women. Anytime he brings it up, he wrinkles his nose. That is not a classic male gesture except for in disgust. And that's one of the basics, one of the seven that I have learned did not come from Ekman originally, came from Darwin and Ekman uh, added to those, which is pretty interesting. He also then sneers. And we typically think of a sneer as showing a canine, right? That's... Primates show canines when they're when they're either terrified or they're angry, but he does that. He illustrates with his hands, and Scott, to your point, when somebody is autistic, they don't close space is what I've typically noticed. And this being the, the billboard of emotion and the way to communicate with people, they don't use it as much. They also don't use their hands and engage you as much. So I don't think he's there. Then he starts to scratch his head as a, an adapter to release nervous energy when he gets to these Gmail accounts. And I think he does something that we would typically call an embedded confession, and that is, I don't have time to make up 300 Gmail accounts. Well, probably he does because we know his things are not going well. So he sets Mark up nicely to be there to, to comfort him after I tear into him pretty good. So you want to, Mark, you want to go next and talk about what you did with that? 
Yeah, so look, if, if you end up in an interview with me, I'm going to be all over your generalizations because from my point of view, the way you generalize, the way you take the universe and boil it down into something that's that's manipulate that you can move around and manipulate, that's a good map as to how you see the world and how you think it should function. So whenever I'm talking to, to anybody in a professional way, I'm trying to work out what, what do they generalize around? What do they boil stuff down into? Well, here's the generalizations we get from him. Pretty much all the women. So we've got all the women. So he's not very detailed. He's not like, well, this woman whose name is X, she said this, and this woman, you know, she said this, her name was this name and it's 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 pretty much all the women and i guess they think so the stress is on they think and right at the end we get these women the stress is on women not these women the stress is on the woman part of it then alongside that uh, alongside the 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 call out to women we do get the disgust yeah we do get this lip pinning up to show the the canine there which i would put in the area of contempt or more importantly disdain now let me tell you the difference between contempt and disdain and why i make it uh disdain is because of these generalizations of all women um disdain is something around a social group if i if i'm disdainful of of you uh you know the 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 watcher the listener here it's that i don't think you belong in our group you shouldn't be part of our society so disdain is very powerful because if if the society disdains you or an individual with power disdains you it means they're going to cut off your ability to live in the group you're dead basically you're you're thrown out of society I would suggest that his mindset is that women in general don't fit in society. They shouldn't be part of his group, his society, as he sees it. So that's why I would suggest we get something I'm starting to see from him at this point. I'm going, we've got something misogynistic here, quite extreme, quite extreme. And so that's why in the interview in the interrogation my mind is going i'm going to hit that i'm going to hit that hard because we might get him to show some agreements with that we might get him uh really showing himself around that and certainly it's embedded enough and it's deep enough that if i call that out to him he's going to feel very much psychologically seen and again that's going to ramp the pressure on him, the psychological pressure of the situation up on him. So that, that's my take on that. Chase, what do you got? So we see a pattern starting here where he's showing contempt towards women and he's using his water bottle as a pacifier every time things start to get difficult. That's all I'm going to say for this. You guys covered a whole lot and we'll go to the next one. Lovely. Great. Yeah, there is somebody that made allocations that you did that there were fake reviews or something. Tell me about that. Uh, pretty much all the women are saying that just because they cannot fathom that I actually have people who like me. I guess they just think everyone's going to agree with them. I mean, if you have a bad experience at a restaurant and you write a two-star review, does that mean everyone's going to write a two-star review? No. <laughs> okay. So they're accusing me of fabricating I reviews. I guess they think I have enough time in my hands to create 300 different Gmail addresses and write five-star reviews, despite the fact that when you click the profiles, you'll see they have pictures of other people and activities of dozens of other reviews in other places, which kind of implies they're real profiles. But, you know, some people are just hard-headed and believe what they want to believe. Like these women, hence why they don't believe my allegations either. My, my side of the things, I should say. That's great. I love your passion. I love your energy. So, so thank you. Yeah. Do we good? Mm -hmm. All right. There's no misunderstanding. Um, so she, she let me text her. It was a long text. Just explaining, um, you, you, you felt my arm and my chin for a split second. This is how it happened. Um, but she didn't believe me. She basically, her reply was basic body mechanics would imply otherwise because she thought I was standing. So she thought it would have been my private, but I was on my knees. And I even sent her a video, the same exact video I'm about to show you, um, in which I show her the table. It's at the lowest level. I have knee pads below there. They're not just there for fun. 
proving that I'm on my knees half the time. Therefore, it's possible you could feel another part of my body. I mean, she didn't see anything either. She didn't turn her head for a split second. She, she didn't hear me unzip. She didn't hear me drop my shorts, which she would have heard because it's a quiet massage room. Um, so those, those arguments are in my favor. But she just wasn't buying it. She's gone on the biggest jihad ever, posting one-star reviews on All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't see, uh, she didn't see anything either. On that phrase, we see him retreat right back uh, and a full kind of turtling gesture there. So uh, a minimizing behavior, essentially making himself smaller. Uh, it's something we instinctually do so the predator will pass on by. It's our most uh, effective, cheapest way not to get attacked is to minimize and make ourselves smaller and stiller. It's part of the um, freeze uh, aspect of, of freeze, uh, flight, fight, faint. So that instantly signals to me there's a lot of stress under she didn't see anything either, which signals to me this is a point, this is something we should dig into because there's some real fear for him around this area. This is the exact part of the story that we should dig into. And he says, well, you know, his the argument is in his favor. Well, I think it should be about evidence or facts, not necessarily argument. So again, it feels to me like he's on his back foot around that. The, the, the big thing I want to point out here is his use of my, my private. So we're, we're into, I would say, quite infantile, juvenile language, <laughs> my private singular. Um, so, so I think... I think he's taught when he says my private, I think he's specifically talk, talking about his penis. I think that's what he's talking about. And yet he doesn't say it. It was his chin. Yeah, you're right, right. And I think to, to what Chase might, if I were Chase, I think Chase would be calling that distancing behavior. I could be wrong, um, but putting my, my Chase hat on, I reckon that's what I'm seeing, but I'm going to wait for Chase to tell me whether I'm I'm right on that one. Uh, so, so Chase, what do you got? That is distancing behavior, absolutely. <laughs> and distancing means uh, is a couple of things. We'll tend to soften the severity of crimes instead of murder. We'll say hurt instead of steal. We might say take, and sometimes we'll completely omit a victim's name. So when somebody says, like, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, that is a form of distancing or psychological distancing. And I group those together. So one thing that innocent people will do, two things, actually, they'll make a strong, confident, positive denial, strong, confident, positive denial that nothing happened. And they will also display anger that doesn't typically dissipate over time. And this is based on research from John Reed. It's back in, in the old uh, Reed manuals. And I thought it was interesting when he said the knee pads aren't just there for fun, which could imply that is one reason, but maybe not another. There might be two reasons there. And he's saying, she didn't hear me unzip. She didn't hear me drop my shorts. Is not clearly saying that the person is a liar, which is a humongous red flag to me. Calling, if someone's saying something that's untrue, it's totally acceptable for us to call them a liar. And guilty suspects tend to focus on evidence or the lack of provable things in a scenario. And innocent people will, will focus on denying the crime, the severity of the crime, and the commission of the crime which we don't see here. And finally, he then refers to her behavior against him as a jihad, which I think is, is a metaphor for him, either A, from some kind of cultural upbringing, he was born here in the United States, or B, it's a metaphor to make people view this person's actions in the most horrific way possible. And that's my quick summary. Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, so we start to see a pattern here, and you'll hear me approach this pattern when we get on the Dr. Phil show. He is negotiating the guilt. He's negotiating the question. If I condition the question is a term a lot of people would use, then I can answer the question the way I want. Did you have sexual relations? Good example. But if I ask you, did you have sex? Well, not really sexual relations. Then you're conditioning the question. And you'll hear that, assuming it made it on Dr. Phil, when I ask him, did you put your genitals on this woman? My bare genitals? Well, no, that's not what I asked you, did I? And he starts that pattern here by saying she didn't hear me unzip. She didn't hear this. She didn't hear that. So his denial is about those things, not about whether he did any of this or not. He gets to that halting pause again when he's talking about her. And I forget exactly where it's here, but you'll hear that, 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 and that halting pause that he used in this very successful business. So it's a really good indicator. And by now, that intake eye, the other eyebrow is sticking up enough. He's poking on it and starting to pay attention to it. And it comes into play in this show. And then that's finally, he, Mark, you hit it. He's looking like a, a Muppet or something as he shrinks into his own body. Yep. Scott. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. Uh, going back to what Chase has talked about, when someone is is uh, guilty of something, they're not going to focus on, they're going to focus differently than the person who's who's innocent. The person, again, who's innocent, you can go in and say, and when you open up, you may say, you sit down and say, hey, look, all the evidence shows that you did this. We know you did it. We talked to two guys down there that saw you do it. So I know you did it. There's no question about you doing it. And the more you talk, the person who didn't do it is most likely just going to so they'll, they'll sit there for a second at the very top and they're going to say, wait a minute, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. And they're going to, they're going to go to 10 on getting angry, especially if it's someone you're talking about a murder or something that's really bad. They're going to go to 10 because they're like my life, you know, oh my God. My life. So they're going to go to 10. That's going to be really hard to bring them back down, really tough to get them calm back down. The person who most likely would be guilty or most who did do it, they're going to, they're going to say, when you say, talk to two guys, they know you did it. They may say, you know, they may get mad and say, no, oh, one man didn't do it, but they'll come down very quickly because they want to know what information you have. And that's what he's waiting on. He doesn't know if this woman's going to tell him other things, which we alluded to. We had more information than we had that we'd gotten from this woman that, that, that was in the little, the online green room that we talked to. We found out what was in the room. We found out what it looked like. We found out what was near the door. There's a crib near the door. There are no curtains. And we we're going to use those things as we talk to him. As, as Chase, the plan was for Chase to put a little mind virus, which is something you throw in somebody's head and they start thinking about it as you're talking to them about something else and it gets bigger. What do they know that, that, I'm, I, that, I need, that, that they haven't told me yet? What do they know? So when that person gets really mad and stays up there, the innocent person, really tough to bring them down because they're concerned about what's going to happen. The guilty person, they're going to know what you have. They're going to keep going. And in this case, he keeps fighting these specific points. He's picked out specific points to fight and keeps bringing them up and tagging them every time. That shows you that most likely in this situation, this guy is being deceptive and he's probably the one that did that or is the, the guilty party in that situation. So yeah. I'll stop right there. We can go. So, but you hit something earlier as well, the whole amygdala issue, because when a person goes into fight or flight, that's real and anger, that's real. It's hard to ramp back down. Oh, yeah. yeah. But if they're pretending. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you get that fired up, it's hard to shut that back down, hard to calm it down. Because one of the that, first there's, lessons. There's so much in play there. One of the first lessons I ever learned about body language and behavior was I was working SEER and guys would all cry. My parents died in a horrible car accident. You know, every SF guy you ever meet, toughest guys on earth. Their kid, all their parents died when they were eight years old in a fiery car crash, they would all tell you. And I went out and talked to a psych who worked with us there, group psych, and I said, how do you overcome that? And he said, well, it takes a certain part of your brain to cry. What do you think happens if you ramp up the pressure? And what happens when you ramp up the pressure and the crying's not real is it goes away. If it's real, it gets worse, just like anger. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we won't get into the intricacies of the fake cry, but we should sometimes, because, man, it is hilarious. I and I, like two days ago on Dr. Phil, there was one on that was fake cry, and I was, I was in the floor. It was so, fun, it was so funny, because they squint those eyes, and they start talking like this, and they'll put something in front of them. It's, oh, it's, um, it's one of my favorite things in the world to see. One of my no very favorite muscle. things. No grief muscle. Oh, not at all. Not at all, because there's no grief. There's no misunderstanding. Um, and so she she let me text her. It was a long text, just explaining. Um, you, you you felt my arm and my chin for a split second. This is how it happened. Um, but she didn't believe me. She basically her reply was basic body mechanics would imply otherwise because she thought I was standing. So she thought it would have been my private, but I was on my knees. 
And I even sent her a video, the same exact video I'm about to show you, um, in which I show her the table. It's at the lowest level. I have knee pads below there. They're not just there for fun, <laughs> proving that I'm on my knees half the time. Therefore, it's possible you could feel another part of my body. I mean, she didn't see anything either. She didn't turn her head for a split second. She, she didn't hear me unzip. She didn't hear me drop my shorts, which she would have heard because it's a quiet massage room. Um, so those, those arguments are in my favor, but she just wasn't buying it. She's gone on the biggest jihad ever posting one star reviews. on. Okay. Uh, we good. Yep. There you go. So you don't think had she not left her key, she probably wouldn't have called the police. She, she was just trying to... Yeah. She may not have even, so that's a shame because that was not reported to the news. So I just, it just looks so much more serious Sure. Uh, than it is, but the, the, but her reporting, contacting the local news did kind of surprise me. That's not something you expect, you know, you, know, you just think you had a bad experience and report me to the state boards, you know, but the news for some guy who just works out of his home, not like out in a public studio and there's some doubt. It just, that definitely caught me by surprise, you know? Sure. I would imagine. So are any, are any of Leah's allegations of inappropriate contact with you true? Or are they all false? Well, she only has one, one allegation. I mean, you said allegations, plural. That, sorry, that's that's my mistake. Yes. Is the allegation, I should say, I'm sorry, not plural, is the allegation that Leah has against you that you inappropriately inappropriately touched her false? Her uh, Leah's allegation against me is completely false. Wonderful. Right. So, yeah, let's talk a Okay, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so when he realizes the question's coming, he exercises his upper forehead in the Greek muscle that Greg displays so beautifully on many of our videos. And he starts nodding as the second question is coming and continues nodding all the way through his answer. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And as he says the word false, he engages in eye blocking which is a potential deception indicator. And then it's followed immediately by an eye roll. And eye rolling is also eye blocking. According to me, I don't know if you guys agree. We've never discussed this. I've seen it a thousand times where somebody's doing, doing this, they're doing an eye block, and they look back at the interrogator too soon. And they realize they made eye contact too soon, and they break it immediately. And the eye roll is very common in that instance which is exactly what happens here. It's a, it's a great textbook response. And it's followed by a contempt facial expression towards the interviewer this time, who is a woman. And he engages another eyebrow flash while he's turning his head to the side. And these are image management for him. He is Especially if, if what Scott said is true. Uh, I disagree slightly with Scott. I think there's a potential for a malignant narcissism here. Granted, I'm no doctor. I only have a few things. This guy turns into, I'm going to use the polite term, into a barracks lawyer suddenly. He is going to parse words, not allegations, allegation. Well, I'd say, well, if any of them are true, then okay. But he starts to parse words. We call that barracks lawyer or something a little bit more rude typically in the Army. Then he, um, he goes to containing all body language. If you notice, his hands stop moving. He's not illustrating. He's not adapting. He's not doing anything. His hands drop. They get down by his side or somewhere off camera. And then I think, Chase, you're on with the eye blocking, but I think his eye roll is more than that. I think he's conscious of breaking eye contact and that it looks deceptive. And so that's something he probably does in normal life. But if he breaks eye contact down or to the side, I think he's afraid that someone will perceive it that way. And I think it's part of this overall image he's trying to portray. To your point, Scott, he's got an image he wants to hold up. And, you know, I'm this guy. If you go and read this guy's profile, he's got X number of degrees. He's come up with new ways of, of getting a college degree. You know, he invented water. I mean, just go read this stuff. He's got all of that in, in play. So, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I want to pick up just on uh, i think greg and chase's point there that he's he is already negotiating again negotiating around the terms so you know uh, a classic as they've just said that eye roll i want to pick up on chase's eye roll so for me the eye roll is going to come in a couple of places 
uh, in that it's it's either going to be an image of disdain again, uh, or it's a juvenile behavior. So we see eye rolls a great deal in teenagers, especially around their parents. You know, their parents do something it's like, oh, there they go again. Again, it's saying, you're really not part of my group. You really don't know how the world works, do you? So again, when I'm looking at interviewing this person, that's a big move. An eye roll is quite a big uh, juvenile move. And I want to be able to trigger a whole bunch more of those. So I think when I'm going into this interview, if I can perform a little like a strong parent around them, I might be able to trigger those kind of behaviors. So go back to the interview, kind of get a sense of what I'm doing, the, the tone of voice that I might have, and a lot of that downward intonation that I'm doing. It's rather like a, a mum or a dad who's telling their child, you know, how, how disappointed and wrong their performance has been. Again, not because that's who I am, though I can be that at times. It's who I'm trying to be in order to provoke an emotional state from him and trigger those behaviours in the studio that we saw in the interview. So you, the audience, watching the Dr. Phil show can go, oh, this is who we've got in front of us. Somebody who is disdainful, disrespectful, of women, of status, of, of uh, the governance of, of the situation. He, he, he was very disdainful of the, the system by which his profession or former profession is being governed. He, those rules don't apply to him. Again, back to Scott's point, this is the classic kind of behavior that we may well see from somebody who is uh, a narcissist or certainly uh, psychopathic certainly doesn't have any um any uh reason why they think the rules of society apply to them uh so scott uh tell us what you got end this one up for us all right well i'm gonna go against everything you guys said about the eye roll i don't think it's eye blocking i don't think he's rolling his eyes i think it's a tick and i think we're seeing his brain flipping out and that's why, and it's it's a it's a tick he's got because he does it I think twice in this thing, and that's not natural. What he's doing is not natural. There, it's a tick. You'll see people with ticks; they'll do the oddest. They'll go, they'll do, have to wear like this thing. I got in this habit a long time ago. We were in the studio once, and I and and my and the engineer, the Scotty Patrick, goes, "Hey man, what are you doing with your eyes?" And it'd been one of those. It was one of those records we were doing that was so stressful. It'd been going on for months, and I was I was doing this with my eyes. He goes, "What are you doing?" I said, I don't know. What am I doing? He said, dude, you've been doing this for like two months. I was like, why didn't you tell me that? What do I do? So that was, a, that was a tick I developed from, from stress is sitting there doing that all the time. So I think what we're seeing there is a stress because I think it is, is uh, amygdala is, is, his whole system is starting to freak out. Now there's a difference in a sociopath and a psychopath. Again, when we're talking about that, every psychopath is a narcissist be they malignant, be they the clinical, however we're however we going to term it, but not every narcissist is a, sarc, is a psychopath. That's a, there's a, there's a big difference there. We've got to keep in, in, in mind as we go along with this. So we're seeing, I agree with what you guys are talking about, but the one part about the eye roll that that's different. That's his brain is, is starting to overload. He's trying to hold in that anger because I'll bet you from looking at this guy, when he gets mad, this guy gets mad. And that's what they call the, the, the slipping of the mask. When you see that, when that thing slips, when a woman marries a man and he's been nice and it's been wonderful up this point, they're kindred spirits, blah, blah, blah. The next thing you know, you get married and five minutes later, this guy turns into a dang monster. I think that's what we're seeing a hint of there as he's trying to control this. It's not he's flipping out and his eyes are going back in his head, but I think that's one of his the things he gets, one of his adapters to get rid of stress, to get rid of a lot of stress. But he's trying to control that because he's on video and he knows it. So he's tr he tries to keep that under control. That's what we're, I believe we're looking at there. Now, back when she asked him, she says, um, is Leah's allegation, when he says, is Leah's, or she says, is Leah's allegations, allegation against you completely false? He doesn't say yes. He goes on to explain again these parts of it that that he should have said yes, and that was it. And he should fight for that yes, and he didn't. He didn't say yes. He waited. Um, then he sneaks a peek at himself again. Back to Chase's thing. He looks at himself again in the in the monitor to see how he looks because he's got that narcissistic 
thing to him, the critical narcissist, and, and I want to go with psychopath at, at, at this point, or I've gone with that already. But that's what I'm seeing there, and that's a whole lot for me, but that's what I got. Well, one thing to, to add, if you don't think these tools work, we were able to induce stress in this guy over the internet. Very quickly, very quickly, too. Tools work, guys. So you don't think, had she not left her key, she probably wouldn't have called the police. She, she was just trying to... Yeah, she may not have even. So that's a shame because that was not reported to the news. So I just, it just looks so much more serious sure. uh, than it is. But, the, the, but her reporting, contacting the local news did kind of surprise me. That's not something you expect, you know. You, know, you just think you had a bad experience and report me to the state boards, you know, but the news for some guy who just works out of his home, not like out in a public studio and there's some doubt. It just, that definitely caught me by surprise, you know. Sure, I would admit. So are any are any of Leah's allegations of inappropriate contact with you true? Or are they all false? Well, she only has one, one allegation. I think you said allegations, plural. That, sorry, that's, that's my mistake. Yes, is the allegation, I should say, I'm sorry, not plural, is the allegation that Leah has against you that you inappropriately, inappropriately touched her false? Her, uh, Leah's allegation against me is completely false. Wonderful. Right. So, yeah, let's talk. All right. Good. Yep. Yeah. Move on. Stupid thing. So, but, you know, the news is never going to report the details of them. So now the public is going to hear it and think I'm just this horrible felon. I mean, it just sounds so much worse than it is. You know, that's how are they are. They- are you a horrible, fe- horrible felon? I, I have the, a perfectly clean background check. I've never been arrested or been to a police station in my life. I want to keep my record clean and I'm fighting now to to do that because this could lead to um, an indictment. It could, you know? Sure. (laughs) All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this one's loaded and I want to take everything because there's a ton for, for us all. One of my things I always talk about is sacred space. We say that a barrier is when I need to get away from you. I put something between us, whatever that might be. Um, an illustr or an adapter is a way I release nervous energy. And if you put a coyote in a cage, you'll pace. When a person crosses their body and fidgets, they're creating what I call sacred space. They're taking space away from you and then making it comfortable. All an adapter is, is making the unknown known, making the uncomfortable comfortable. Very simply, this guy's got sacred space. Then he uses a push pull word, a horrible felon versus what other kind of felon? He brings that up. He's got a negotiation word, which I would have hopped on. And then when they, I'm not a felon, I'm not, I have a clean background check. Have you done anything horrible? No, I've got a clean background check. What does that mean? I I will tell you a story. A guy working in our SCIF, top secret clearance in New Jersey in 1999, was taken out in handcuffs because his girlfriend was in the trunk. A background doesn't mean anything. A background check when is the question. And then he stresses the word felon with felon, overdoes it, and then a lip compression. And I'll leave it at that. We all know that lip compression is withholding emotion or information in some way. So this guy is hiding all kinds of information. And we could sense and feel there's a box of bees waiting to happen here. And all we did was open the the lid off off the box and let him go. So I think it was useful and helpful to be able to see and expect what was coming. He's all kinds of anxiety built up in him. Scott, what do you got? All right. When he starts, when uh, he answers, the, when he answers and he says, I have a perfectly clean black background check, it gets really quiet. And he's not saying, hey, man, I got, I don't have anything. I, my background check is perfect. He doesn't say that. He, says, I have, he talks almost like a child. He gets really quiet and almost childlike. As he says, I have a perfectly uh, clean background check. That's that's just weird out of the gate. That's just that's just odd. Then you see as he's answering that head goes back and he starts looking down his nose at her on on the internet. So that's another little cue for you that lets you know that says that's just a little check off point for for a narcissist or narcissistic uh, personality. Of course, he's rubbing his hands as an adapter, but we see his nostrils flare when he says um, when fe- felon when he says felon we see his nostrils flare I got huge ones so you can see mine really easily <laughs> but you can at the angle you can see his really easily but his flare because you can see that anger starting to build in him as he tries to control it um, there's um, as he starts going his blink rate I'll leave blink rate to you Chase I'm not going to steal I know you, you got stuff on that um, they use his, his qual- qualifiers to prop up that answer so um, 
what do you, let's see. Uh, he never says no. He says, no, I never says, no, I'm not a felon. If you, somebody asks you if you're a felon, you say, no, no. And that would be it. And you'd wait for him to say something else. Then, then that's about it. You say, no, and probably explicative, no, I'm not a felon. And then when he uncrosses his arms, that's, that's when he starts sitting on his hands. He's, he, he goes and he's sitting on his hands. That is an indicator. It doesn't mean every time someone's someone's being deceptive. But man, that's that's for me. I, that's one of the things I look for when I'm looking for my rule of threes. Of look for three things before we say. I think we're looking at someone's being deceptive. That's well, he, one of the things. It's I look not for. his baseline to sit on his hands. That's right. Yeah. 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 I don't know whose baseline it would be. You know. Yeah. And we didn't seem to do that other than than right then. All right, Chase. What do you got? I've got 14 things here. I'll just do three. I I know we've all got a ton of stuff. Yeah, we got tons of stuff on this guy. I'll do the the blink rate first since you left it for me. Uh, The blink rate starts out high. He's under stress already. So his blink rate starts out at a 26. And keep in mind, 13, maybe 16, somewhere around there is our normal blink rate when we're in conversation. Higher blink rate means higher stress. It goes up to a 96 towards the middle of this when he's des- describing to this person how his background's clean and all this. Number two, solid, unwavering eye contact. We've all heard our parents say, look me in the eye and tell me you didn't do that. Look me in the eye and tell me X. That myth is so pervasive that people actually believe that liars will make less eye contact and now there's new studies. I can't, sorry guys, I can't <laughs> say the, the university that did it, but liars and people being deceptive will make more eye contact than truth tellers because truth tellers are accessing memories to answer the question. Finally here for this list of three, he uses what's called a resume statement. And this is a classic, perfect, beautiful example of what a resume statement is. So if I'm talking to someone who is accused of touching someone inappropriately in their car uh, and I ask him, John, uh, what happened in the softball field parking lot when Emily was in the passenger seat of your car? And he says, I have a master's degree in behavioral psychology. I know exactly what that would do to a kid. I've been volunteering, teaching this softball team for the last nine years, and my kids are friends with Larry's kids. That's a resume statement. It also doesn't answer the question. So that's great. All that stuff uh, put together and a couple other things. His deception score was a 14. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, let me let me just address that that part where you're talking about the study about the, uh, the looking the looking at someone. The reason someone keeps looking at you, obviously we know this now, is because they want to make sure you believe them. As, as the person who's being honest, they're going to look around, like you said, they're going to be accessing and thinking. The other person wants to keep their brain, wants to keep looking at you to make sure you're telling them that, that you believe them so you can add qualifiers if they're not. The study was done. I can't remember the guy's name. It's in one of my decks when I do training. It's Alda uh, Bridge. Yeah, it was Bridge. B-R-I-J. If you want I to can't look at the yeah. university, but it is, it's Bridge. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go against you guys on that. The one I'm talking about isn't that. He got okay. all the speak. He got he got, he got uh, everyone to go out to different continents. He used all kinds of people to go out and do the study. Is this the one we're talking about? That that might be Good Johnson. Mm. So there's more than one study. Let me, let me add one thing for, for you. It, that is cultural because if you go to the Middle East, eye contact is pervasive and they make constant eye contact. They go out of their way not to break eye contact. And in Asia, less eye contact based on status and that kind of thing in, in certain countries, not even Korea, that was a part of it. But I will tell you this, in Americans, it is pretty consistent that people make about 50 to 75% eye contact. And if you don't understand why, this is why people always give me a hard time about eyes, but remember your... Favorite song and six words in. Try to answer that question with with your eyes straight ahead. It's 
just damn near impossible because your brain is dancing and trying to recall information to Scott's point. So a lot of interrogations, a few hundred, maybe a few more than that. And in all of those, it was one of my best indicators. When a guy uh, and, me with his eyes. And one of the, and, and again, no, and to that, Greg, Joe Navarro, the first three faces on the Mount Rushmore body language, he says he, he one of his opening things is always the behavior you're looking for is either limbic or it's cultural. So you have to decide what you're looking at there. So a lot of people say, oh, that this is an absolute because you do every time in different cultures. This means something different in the Middle East. And yep. so does this. Yep. So you got to be careful to cut your hands off over there if you do those at, at the wrong time. So, all right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so to that point of eye contact, because uh, in term, it, because it's cultural, different levels of eye contact, different reasons in different countries, what we're looking at here is most, uh, most probably a, a moderator or what everybody else calls regulators. So regulators, moderators change country to country. That's why if I go to Brazil and I get into a conversation, I can't work out if it's my turn or their turn because the moderators, the regulators being used uh, for it's your turn uh, in, in my culture is doesn't mean it's your turn in the Brazilian culture. So it's, it gets very confusing for me. And I'm like, why do they keep on talking? Or why can't I get a word in here? Because my cultural instinct doesn't know what it's looking out for to know whether I can join in or not. I think in, 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 in this case, eye contact is often used as a moderator or regulator during lying to control the process that's that's going on. So what have I got on the rest of this? Look, are you a horrible felon? And we see both shoulders raise. I would say what we're seeing in that is he doesn't as yet know the answer <laughs> as to if he's a horrible felon or not. It's it's open <laughs> for him. Now he has got a, a logic or a pseudo logic, a, a, a wonky logic to get himself out of this, which is, you know, I don't have, um, you know, any, my background check is absolutely fine. We've all discussed that that doesn't mean anything about are you a horrible felon or not? Are you a bad person? You know, should you be fingered by the law? Uh, well, there's nothing on my rap sheet. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so for me, in any kind of interview, I would be right on people's generalizations and I'm right on their wonky logic as well, because often their wonky logic is trying to convince me of something. And that's what he's trying to do here. He's doing reputation control, which is his whole reason for being on the Dr. Phil show, is he's doing reputation control. I mean, I think we've worked out that he's doing it from 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 not a good position, from yeah. a really bad position. Mm. But he's trying his best to do uh, that reputation control. Greg, you, you want to jump yeah, in? So I, I just want to point out this guy had been on Catfish before and he had been on Judge Mathis before. So I, I think he just wants his picture on the airwaves more than he's trying to clear up anything. I agree with you, Mark. But if he came here for 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 us clearing his name, I think that was an ugly mistake. Yeah. And those those are classic psychopathic tendencies. They're the hardcore narcissist, the clinical narcissist, um, but those but those are our classic almost checkoffs on on Hare's list as a whole. If you look at that list and look at the, what he's doing, there. because yeah, no matter what happens, no matter how horrible it is, the deed you've done. You'll hear serial killers. They want to be interviewed. They want to talk about it. They want to have people come in and talk to them they, because they because it makes them famous. People talk about them. To that, no, that, that's all I got. That's all I'll say on that point. Sorry, step there, Mark. Sorry, I just thought it was a let me just pick up on one last thing there, which is this piece of anger, because I saw the anger in there as well. And so, again, when I'm thinking about our process of doing this interview, I'm certainly thinking, how can I get him angry? How can I get the audience to see this true anger that's inside him around this? Because there's something I would suggest, and I think everybody agrees me, with me here, there's something quite dangerous about that anger that he has in him. Something that, that, that we maybe haven't at this point seen the full potential, the full danger 
of that anger. And I think the strategy here was if we can help the audience see some of that ramped up, then the audience might be able to see who Tarek really might be rather than him control his reputation on this show. Now, having said that, it doesn't stand a lot of chance because Dr. Phil's pretty good at this. He's been around a long, long time. You know, I have to say, I, I, we all agree on this. Watching Dr. Phil work was just... Wow. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. yeah. That, was, that was good stuff, man. Seeing I, that go down live was really, without any editing, man, that was good. Well, like I said to him in, in the note, that was that was a fine piece of interrogation we were watching. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, let, let me, I, I would have, I would have thought he was. He's been interrogating people for a long time yeah, with the yeah, yeah, yeah. training. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, at that that part where Mark was talking about how we were trying to to get information out of him on that, and they may have cut this out. As there's conversations going on, I'm trying to break in. And I keep calling him Isaac, and I think they had us say they may have have, have changed it and put the word. Uh, Tarek in there. I think they were on the impression I thought his name was Isaac. I knew his name was Tarek, but he used Isaac as an alias. So I thought I could start hollering at him and get and yell Isaac, Isaac, as I kept saying that. So I get his attention that would throw him off even more, which I think worked because I did end up talking to him for a couple of seconds after that. And I could tell by looking at him, he was like, these, I don't know what they know. I can't tell what these people know. So we're doing, as you see this, some of the behavior may look like it's out. It may look odd or it may look, you go, what's what do they're being, why would they be doing that at this point? That's why we're trying to get him to flip out at that point or to lose his temper, not flip out and give it, just puke up a bunch of information for us. Also, the, the name Isaac is is used as a, uh, a pseudonym for him or another mm -hmm. mask. Yes. That he yeah. Yeah. Another yeah, identity maybe. that he creates. So again, by using, by flipping between those two, uh, we can move him between one character and another character. So he's in a, a, a constant pattern interrupt. Again, that yeah. might cause him to be more truthful about, uh, you know, go back to his more truthful behaviors and tell us what's really going on. So all of these are perfect. There's, there's nothing happening on that video by Not accident. accidentally. Stupid thing. So, but, you know, the news is never going to report the details of them. So now the public is going to hear it and think I'm just this horrible felon. I mean, it just sounds so much worse than it is, you know? That's how are they are. They are you a horrible, fe horrible felon? I, I have the, a perfectly clean background check. I've never been arrested or been to a police station in my life. I want to keep my record clean and I'm fighting now to, to do that because this could lead to um, an indictment. It could, you know? Sure. Yeah, look, the last thing I would add is Dr. Phil's trying to give this guy some help and try to get him to a point where he realizes he needs help. And if we did, guys, what I was proud of the operation to do is he saw Dr. Phil as a friendly by the time we were done and ran yeah. to him, you could see it. He was like, yeah. Help me. yeah. And yeah. that is yeah. what we did work because I think chase, he thought you were going to be friendly because your tone was calm. Yeah. And then when you said, I went, hey, I went Andy Griffith on him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. That was great, man. Yeah. That was beautiful guys. But yeah. I think he realized yeah. that Andy Griffith was closing the, the jail door on his fingers and he might need yeah. to run to Dr. Phil. So I think, yeah. yeah, I think in the outcome, great orchestration. Good. He, did, he did ask for, for the help. He did ask for the help that was offered. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't put a lot of money on him taking that help. I hope like, he does. Yeah, oh, hope he's he going to have to. I, I, it wouldn't be my, my big bet. I would not bet much on it at yeah. all. Uh, but it's great that, that the show... Uh, and we, along with Dr. Phil and the other people involved there, managed to get him to that point where he went, okay, give me some yeah. help. Because yeah. he really needs it. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, so keep in mind, as you watch this one more time, we created a, a situation where we sent him down what we're going to call a shoot. And he and as he sort of pinballed off of each one of us till we got him down there to the end where Chase caught him and he was in the impression Chase was going to take care of him. And it, that didn't happen. And that's after that, so we started started bouncing around even more psychologically, see if we could get more out of him once we threw him back to Doctor Phil. So, all right, be good. Yeah. Go so he, each gave him a punch, and he came to me, and I gave him an injection. Yeah. Of a mind yeah. virus. Yeah. 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 And, and guys, yeah. this is the way. If you if you ever want to know how interrogation works, this is the way it's intended to work: psychological pressure and release. It's how you get people to talk. 
It's a matter of creating the right trust environment and getting to a point where that person rolls over and gives you, again, it's just like I, I said before, giving them permission to do the wrong thing, right? That's all it is. Exactly. Good. Now, at the end of this, and since this is over, go ahead and subscribe if you like what we're doing and hit that little bell so you'll know when we have something new come out. Please do that because we're um, trying to build our numbers like everybody else is. But if you like it, go ahead and, and subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. All right. Well, that's a good one, fellas. That one's in the can, and uh, I'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks. Bill. Bye now. Oh, oh Scott, so. in the beginning, yeah. 10 minutes, 15 minutes in, mm -hmm. something fell beside me. I heard it. Okay. And I, it also scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Okay. I'll see if I can, I'll blow somebody up or something. Mark was talking, but can you make him full screen or something? Everybody, I'll, try, I'll try to get out of it so it doesn't, so it doesn't look weird. You could see me go like this. <laughs> 